Hello, and you're very welcome to episode 50 of The Fifth Court, a podcast on legal affairs presented by myself, Peter Leonard Barrister. Myself, Mark Tottenham, Barrister and editor of Decisive Law Reports. Did I really say 50 there, Mark? You did. Can you believe we have recorded a half century of episodes? Absolutely. When did is all, that, that, is all that, that happen? Is that a cricketing metaphor? Well, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um... That's a bit of a milestone, isn't it? It certainly is, exactly. Uh, and do you think we're getting the hang of it at long last, or I, what do you think? I, I, I think we we'll could leave, try harder. L- l- leave, leave our <laughs> listeners, stroke <laughs> listeners, to judge that. Maybe, maybe like the French Revolution, too early to tell. Exactly. You know, who knows? Uh, but look, that's wonderful. We've done yeah. fifty episodes, and I think we're we're delighted with that. And how fitting for our fiftieth episode that we have the second part of our interview with Mr. Justice Gerard Hogan, who's marking the 50th anniversary of McGee and the Attorney General. And that's, of course, a case that has changed Ireland irreversibly way back in 1973. Yep, yep. And stay tuned, yep. folks. You, you this is really well, good. Of course, oh, of course I do. Of course young. I do. That's the year I went to school for the first time, I think, 1973. But anyway, there you go. OK, first to three cases from the Decisis website. In our first case, the government had announced a strategy entitled Food Vision 2030, which was challenged by an environmental group uh, by way of judicial review. And this was on the basis that it was not compliant with the EU Habitats Directive. This is the case of Friends of the Irish Environment, CLG, against the Government of Ireland. It's the decision of Mr Justice Humphreys. Yes. So, uh, as you said, the government had this strategy called Food Vision 2020, which is all to do with sort of agribusiness and all that kind of thing. It's the kind of five, eight, ten year plan um, in respect of how we produce uh, food in this country. But it's very obviously a government policy rather than a specific decision. But the government had decided to engage in an appropriate assessment, which is the EU Habitats Directive provision and a strategic environmental assessment. And as a result, then um, this group, Friends of the Irish Envi- Environment, sought to judicially review it on the basis that it was not compliant with the Habitats Directive. And the government said, well, no, this is more of a government policy. It is not a reviewable decision. And they said, well, you can't say it's not a reviewable decision because you have invoked the EU legislation by having an an appropriate assessment and a strategic environmental assessment. But the court held with the government and said, no, this is not a judicially reviewable decision. This is a policy. It's a policy rather than a decision. decision. Okay, very interesting. Okay. Case number two, uh, there was an application before the court to dissolve a partnership involving a stepfather and stepchildren and they operated together a nursing home. The plaintiff was the stepfather and the defendants obviously were the stepchildren and he had stopped paying them their share of the profits or they had stopped paying him the share of the profits. No, somebody wasn't paying somebody anyway. This is the case of Cahill versus Seepersad and it's a decision of Ms. Justice Roberts. That's correct. And this is a very involved case. It's just an interesting case, I think, where it's basically like so many businesses that are family run and where the family breaks down, you know, what emerges from this. This is actually an interim judgment in what is essentially a dissolution of a partnership. But as you said, the plaintiff was seeking certain orders. But what transpired in the hearing of this case was that the plaintiff, who was the stepfather, had effectively failed to make certain payments to the stepchildren. And so the the court very much held in their favour and made orders that he pay damages to them. But it's only an interim decision that there's more to go. So the moral of the story is don't go to court if you haven't paid your bills. I think that is one of the morals of the story. (laughs) Okay. All right. Very good. And finally, we have a case of judicial review proceedings arising from a planning decision, and they were issued one day out of time. Now, I feel the brother or the sister's pain, but this was another decision of Mr. Justice Humphreys. I think I could put money on how this one was going to go. Well, this is a case where the uh, leave had been granted. The application, as, as you said, was brought one day out of time. Um, This was then pointed out by the respondent on board Planola and an application was made to extend time for judicial review by the one day necessary. And uh, Mr Justice Humphrey said that in this particular case, there was no good and sufficient reason for extending time and there would be nothing to stop the applicants from acting more quickly in the first instance. Okay, back shortly with part two of our interview with Mr Justice Gerard Hogan. Silence. In the fifth court. <laughs> 
Okay, well, Jared, we're 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 back to the second part of our interview, and we talked about the progressive nature of the McGee decision, mm-hmm. and you know how earth shattering it was in the Ireland of the day. Now let's move on ten years. And we have the David Norris case. And this was about, you know, the prohibition on homosexuality contained in the Criminal Amendment Act of 1883, I think. Mm-hmm. And David Norris, very public figure at the time, a lecturer in English in Trinity College, he challenged that mm-hmm. and it went before the High Court mm-hmm. and he lost his case. Um, was that Mr. Justice Costello? Mr. Justice McWilliam. McWilliam, sorry, I beg your pardon. And then it went to the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. And we talked about the progressive nature of of the decision in McGee. Can, before we get to that, how had the composition of the Supreme Court changed in the intervening 10 years? Uh, it had changed, but not much uh, in a way. Um, Mr. Justice Walsh was still a member of the court, but he didn't sit on the Norris case. And Mr. Justice Henshi and Mr. Justice Griffin, who had been mainstays uh, of the majority in McGee, were uh, still there. And Niall McCarthy, of whom I spoke about at the very end of the last episode, had been appointed directly to the Supreme Court as a measure of his standing as counsel in November 1982. So you had a Supreme Court consisting of Chief Justice Higgins, Mr. Justice Finlay, President of the High Court, Mr. Justice Henshee, Mr. Justice Griffin and Mr. Justice McCarthy. Okay. Now, when we talked about the McGee case, we talked about unenumerated rights, as, as I used to understand them. And you've talked about derivative rights yeah. now, and maybe that's a better way to characterise. You know, it comes from the existing articles within the Constitution, and yeah. they can be developed and, and considered, yeah. and, and they can grow with time, and there's leeway there. Yeah. But in this decision, our infamous decision, maybe if I, if I characterise it that way, of the Chief Justice O'Higgins, Tom O'Higgins at the time, he didn't bother with any of that. He went straight to the preamble and the Christian nature of the preamble. Yeah. Uh, I suppose if you look at this from a sort of a realist school, uh, before we just consider, look at the the judgment, um, I think there's a lot to be said uh, for what my colleague and friend David Gwynne Morgan uh, said about the Norris case. He said, Norris is not perfectly consistent with McGee, and nobody really would try to say it was. Uh, But he said that the real explanation, he thought, uh, was that the Supreme Court had this intuitive feeling in 1973, that the Irish people were, if you like, ready for McGee or almost ready for McGee, uh, even though it did come as a surprise and a shock. Whereas they were, so to speak, not ready in 1983, or at least not ready for this to be, so to speak, sprung on them by judicial decision. Now, that was his explanation, and I, I think there's possibly a lot to be said for it. What about the notion, I saw a footnote in your article, which was fascinating, and it was a quotation from Colin Tobin, the celebrated yeah. writer, who wrote about this. And he said, you know, that, that David Norris, as the protagonist in bringing this legal action, was the best of people, and suggested maybe he was the worst of people in, in a gentle way. You know, the best in the sense that he was an academic, and he was somebody who was courageous, and he had set out his stall in Irish society, and yeah. he wasn't going to be intimidated. Yeah. But on the other hand, he was somebody who was charismatic, who seemed to be living a good life, yeah. and he wasn't going to be a sympathetic figure. Unlike, you know, Miss McGee, who, you know, was a young woman who obviously wanted to have a sexual relationship going forward, but couldn't afford to get pregnant. Yeah, um, I think Colin Tobin puts it that you could say it was difficult at one level for Mr. Norris to say how exactly he had been uh, disadvantaged by the operation of the legislation. Um, actually... It, uh, and I think that's also possibly part of the subtext of this. Tom O'Higgins was a very fine judge and has has given many leading judgments, very well written, many of them upholding the rights of defendants in criminal proceedings at a time when, when those defendants needed protection. He has a fine record. Look, it's very difficult to stand over, uh, certainly by modern standards, what was said in 1983 uh, as a matter of history. And that's just the way it was. Sometimes, goodness knows, I know this more than anybody else, sometimes judges make a wrong call and get it wrong. And if you start off on the wrong foot, there's sometimes no way back. Yes, and that's very understandable. Uh, Absolutely. uh, I think that's possibly the best way I can put it. Remember, I mean, first thing, you've got two really judgments of superlative quality who Henshi were dissenting, Henshi and McCarthy. And Henshi's judgment, I personally regard as the single greatest judgment 
ever delivered by a Supreme Court judge. I mean, it is magnificent in terms of its prose, but also magnificent in terms of its courage. Because let's not forget that, to put this in context, is that the dissents, three two, but the dissents of Judge Henshi and Judge McCarthy uh, were really the first public acknowledgement of the rights of if you like, a persecuted sexual minority that we've ever had in the history of the state. The first sort of recognition of all the the problems and uh, vicissitudes that were a sexual minority uh, were burdened with sometimes in a very aggressive and unpleasant way, deeply unpleasant way by the state. And that is the first acknowledgement of that. And, uh, you know, I just don't think that they've ever got that credit for that. You know, I I think I may have said in the last episode, but I'm going to say it again, you know, McGee was in some ways the the judicial equivalent of the moon landing. You know, it was way ahead of its time in terms of, if you like, the sophistication of our jurisprudence. And if McGee was the moon landing, uh, well, Norris was a kind of an attempt to land on Mars, if you know what I mean. Uh, And um, should we be completely surprised that, you know, the Martian lander came close, came very close, but it didn't quite make it there. And I, I can't help but thinking that there may have been some judicial sentiment that the Irish people were simply not ready for a judicial decision along these lines. But but talking about Chief Justice O'Higgins, and I'm going to bring Mark in here because he's the international expert on everything and on domestic law as well. But it was interesting that across the pond again, because we're going to talk about Roe Roe Mm. versus Wade, the famous case from 1973, same year Mm. as as, as McGee. But there was a case called Bowers. Yeah. Where um, Chief Justice Berger, um, very, kinda, very much, he was he was a Tom O'Higgins fan in yeah, terms of his thinking. It, yes, absolutely. Nineteen eighty six, three years three later. Three years later, absolutely. Again, it's often forgotten that in in Bowers and Hardwick. Now it's since been over overruled that decision, but in Bowers and Hardwick in nineteen eighty six, the U.S. Supreme Court split five four with the Chief Justice in the majority giving a judgment speaking about the Judeo uh, Christian character of the law uh, and that's why that there was no such right to engage in uh, homosexual sodomy and it's not dissimilar in some ways to the kind to the kind of things that chief justice higgins was saying in norris but in a sense the response is different maybe we are very hard on ourselves whereas the americans tend to deplore i suppose judgments they disagree with but they still say look you know we have this great system and okay, we've occasional <laughs> blips, uh, uh, but uh, whereas we, I think, are rather hard on ourselves. Look, as I think I've indicated, the language of Norris was unhappy and the reasoning of the majority, I think, with respect, was unhappy. But one mustn't forget the precise context in which this was appearing. And also remember, Norris was given in April 1983. And at the time, you know, the pro-life amendment uh, the Eighth Amendment was going through the Oireachtas. And the reason principally, or the ostensible reason it was going through the Oireachtas, was because of concern about judicial pronouncements of this kind. And had the Supreme Court decided, gone the other way, 3-2, and found this legislation unconstitutional, well, I, I, one imagines that a lot of people would say, well, look, what is next? And I think there was also that context. I, think. Well, I suppose that <clears throat> that brings us back to McGee, really, because McGee obviously was he- heard in December or de- delivered in December of 1973 mm. and found that there was this unspecified personal right to marital privacy. But in January of that year in America, the decision had been delivered in Roe and Wade, mm. which was where the Supreme Court found that the ban on abortion in the state of Texas was unconstitutional. Mm. They not only found that it was unconstitutional in respect of uh, Ms. Rowe, who brought the the case, but they went the extra mile, so to speak, and set term limits and said that uh, there was effectively an absolute right to a termination up to 12 weeks and a fairly broad right to a termination up to 24 weeks. Now, there is no mention of Roe and Wade in McGee, but Clearly, the the fact that the Supreme Court in Ireland was capable of finding the ban on contraception to be unconstitutional must have resonated with certain people who noticed that a very similar 
decision was made in respect of the right to abortion in the US. And clearly there was a fear that maybe not that Supreme Court, but some Supreme Court might make a similar decision to Roe and Wade. And it's reasonable to say, I think, that that gave rise to the pro-life amendment campaign. Yeah, it did. Um, and from their perspective, and I stress from their perspective, you, Sorry, so do I. <laughs> you, you, you can see, in a sense, where they were coming from. I think uh, it was improbable as a matter of reality that an Irish court would follow Roe and Wade, even if you could say at one level, this was the logical follow on from it. I just don't think it would have happened for all sorts of reasons that we can understand. And even if, as I argued in this article, to which Peter very kindly made reference, actually, if you look at the unadorned language of Article 40 of the Constitution, as compared with the single word on which all this US jurisprudence rests, the word liberty in the 14th Amendment. I mean, so to speak, a legal Martian looking at the two documents would say, now, which do you want? You know, you want you want to advance the case of personal rights. Which do you choose? Article 40 or the 14th Amendment? Our Martian friend would undoubtedly choose Article 40 because it gives far more, it's far more uh, embracing, it gives far more, in one level, far more powers uh, and play uh, to the courts and f- f- places greater obligations on the state than the slender words of the 14th Amendment might be thought to do. That isn't how quite how it's worked out in practice. The 14th Amendment has been given a very expanded meaning over about 150, well, on odd years of US jurisprudence. And Article 40 certainly has been, you know, used a lot, but not quite in the absolutely expanded way the 14th Amendment has. In fact, one of the points I think made by Rune McCormick in his book was that while a number of unenumerated or unspecified rights have been found by the Supreme Court, there hasn't been a new unenumerated right found since 1979. Well, one could possibly argue that, but the freewheeling unenumerated rights uh, jurisprudence had its heyday in the 1970s. And uh, I think since, in particular, a recent decision called Friends of the Irish Environment, where the Chief Justice Clark spoke about that really the doctrine being derivative rights and that they must be closely linked to the actual text of the Constitution. That's been a dominant thinking, I think, for a little while. Sure. But um, going back to Rowan Wade, I mean, uh, the reasoning in that is, I suppose, certainly from an Irish perspective, a very unusual one, because it was, I think, a 7-2 decision. And the majority effectively found that there was a right of privacy that gave right to a right of to, to terminate pregnancy. The minority, the, the dissenting judgments, don't speak of the rights of the unborn child or the, 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 make reference to rights to life. The primary concern is judicial overreach. That yeah. Essentially, they're saying, which I think is not an unreasonable point, that the, the Supreme Court was effectively seeking to legislate rather than leave the matter to, to the, the individual states to, de, to decide their own law on abortion. Yes, but even the two dissenting judgments in Roe, Justice White and Justice Rehnquist, uh, seem to contemplate that an absolute ban on abortion would be unconstitutional. Their objection really was to the overbroad and, from their perspective, unnecessarily prescriptive character of the judgment of Mr. Justice Blackman for the majority, which contained this trimester theory, first, second and third trimesters, uh, which many legal scholars considered to be the equivalent of sort of judicial legislation, because how is this actually linked to constitutional law. It's more like the response of a state legislature or at federal level Congress. So I think part of the problem, no matter where you stand on the issue of abortion, was the the poorly reasoned quality of the majority judgment of Mr. Justice Blackman. I I mean, as I think Chief Justice John Roberts says in the most recent Dobbs case, and I would respectfully agree with him, it's a matter of US constitutional law, not for me, but uh, I think that it would have been possible. And from the perspective of those who are pro-choice, better had the basis of Roe and Wade been articulated in a different way. And that certainly 
could have been done. It could have been done in terms of equality and it could have been debates between men and women and it could have been done in terms of medical autonomy uh, and the right to control your own medical welfare, which is a long-standing tradition in the common law in all jurisdictions. Um, at the end of one of our previous episodes where we were speaking to you, you spoke of what an admirer you were of US jurisprudence. Yeah. I suppose, would it be fair to say that uh, Rowan Wade would not be fit in with your 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 the greatest hits the, uh, of, of the American Supreme Court? Look, candidly, no, uh, no, that won't come as a surprise. I mean, mm. uh, if you look at it in terms of legal quality, no. And I still think that the the great American judges, uh, Holmes, Brandeis, Cardozo, Hughes, a whole range of them, their contribution to constitutional law in the English speaking and indeed in the general Western world has been immense. And Irish courts have certainly been influenced by what their American counterparts have done. Uh, And I think that isn't sufficiently acknowledged. But look, that's only a personal view. Well, and I suppose one of the things you can say about Rowan Wade is that it's a great illustration of how what the Supreme Court gives, the Supreme Court can take away. Because notwithstanding the fact that uh, it was expected to be overturned or substantially restricted in the KC case in, I think, 1992, Just uh, much more recently, the Dobbs case effectively said this was wrongly decided and therefore it is no longer the law of the United States. And I suppose what that opens the door to is a lot of other, shall we say, liberal decisions of the US Supreme Court being overturned in the future. And I I suppose the one that seems very vulnerable would be the same-sex marriage decision in Obergefell, which I think um, Clarence Thomas effectively said that's something we need to look at. Yeah, Um, uh, Clarence Thomas whatever you think about him, uh, has been consistent saying that this implied rights, substantive due process, as they call it in the United States, really has no place in, in, in US constitutional law. And if that was the case, then, you know, contraception, Griswold, uh, marriage equality, Ogre Befell would all fall by the wayside. Now, the majority, the rest of the majority in Dobbs uh, were at pains to say, no, 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 this is a special case. And it based on, as they saw it, the weaknesses in the reasoning in, in, in Roe and Wade. Again, look, it's not for me to comment really on contemporary US developments, but one could equally say, uh, no matter how poorly reasoned the original decision was in Roe and Wade, it's been there for 50 years and people have altered their positions on the strength of it. And that's a reason not to overrule it. But look, that's a matter for that court and their system yes. and not for me. Okay, and you're being, I can understand, being very cautious about making any sort of commentary in relation to that. Okay, let's bring you back to our side of the Atlantic. Mm. And let's go back to the McGee case, which this is all about, and celebrating this case, which is going to be 50 years old next month, and probably 50 years old at the time this case goes out. Mark had a very good question there, where he talked about the Ruin McCormack line about maybe 1979 was the last unenumerated right. You you, you gently disagreed with that, but you said the 70s were the heyday. Mm. You talked about the moon landings, if I can mangle your metaphor a little Mm. bit. Mm. I mean, and and Mars, you made reference to Mars, but now we're potentially going to land on Mars. Going forward, I mean, these were huge decisions, big leaps that were taken by your your predecessors Mm. on the Supreme Court. Where do you see, I mean, obviously, until it arises, maybe you can see what, what's going to happen. But, I mean, is there room, do you think, in our constitution for, for judicial leaps like that going forward? It's probably an unfair question, but I'm just wondering, is, is, there, is there a potential? Are, are, are we done now? Are we done? Well, look, uh, uh, the way I would answer that question, Peter, is this, is, is that in the 1970s onwards, there was recognised weaknesses in our guarantees of personal liberty and individual liberty, which were to some degree, and you can argue the the extent of it, but to some degree were capable and should have been addressed by the judicial branch of government, tasked as they were under the constitution with protecting individual liberty. Now, you might say we have come a long, long way as a society. We have still lots and lots of problems that everybody's aware about. But one might say in general that those problems are ones that are best addressed by the executive and legislative branches uh, and not by the judiciary. 
But the judiciary still have a vital role in protecting individuals, often at the who are affected in a profound way by legislation which sometimes has unintended consequences, uh, but still works in a very unfair way in their case. You could say, you might want to call them micro-injustices, but if you want, but if you are the victim of that injustice, it's a very real one to you. So, I mean, I see that the court system have an important role in protecting individual rights uh, and um, you know, for all its faults, and I hear its faults more than its virtues, but I would on this instance again stress the virtues of a constitution that protects individual liberty in a profound way and gives the mechanism uh, for that to be addressed in three ways. Our democratic system through the Iraqis, the judiciary via declarations of unconstitutionality, but in the final analysis, as you use the language of Article 6, in final appeal to the people who can make a decision in respect of which they are sovereign uh, by amending the Constitution. Yes, and, and we have been masters at that. I mean, the amount of referenda that we've had since 1937, are we up to what, 40 now, are we? Uh, yes, in or they're, about, they're about, they're about 40. I mean, you could, you need a sort of a Goldilocks figure, uh, neither too much nor too little. Uh, too many referenda, I think, would be a bad idea. Yes. Because um, uh, you can have too much of direct democracy. But it's interesting that Article 6 speaks about final appeal. It doesn't contemplate that you would resort to this casually. It would be as the final way of resolving a long-standing problem within society. And that's the ultimate safeguard of you've got the sovereignty of the people. I suppose it's worth noting that, that you know, we're coming up to the centenary of the, of the Courts of Justice Act, um, that, you know, in, in some of our neighbouring European states, there has been interference with the, the courts in Hungary and in Poland. Um, Israel has completely uh, sought to amend its constitution, uh, irrespective of what other things it's been up to. I mean, we, we have been very fortunate in Ireland that we have had a fairly stable democracy and there hasn't been a similar kind of interference um, and But, you know, you only need to look, for example, at the prorogation case in the UK where the Supreme Court was relied upon to prevent uh, legislative overreach or, or, sorry, governmental overreach. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's very easy to forget that the Supreme Court is there to protect against those kind of steps. Well, look, we're certainly far from perfect and the judiciary are certainly far from perfect and the record, you know, one can both praise and criticise at the same time. But... Um, what I sometimes say when I meet law students uh, is this, is that you know when I hear the criticisms of the Constitution, which are well ventilated and often, not for me to say really, but many people would think that they're well made. But I say to them things like this is, you go and find a Constitution that better protects habeas corpus than you'd find in Article 40. You go and find a Constitution that has a better system of uh, protection of findings of unconstitutionality and of then our system. You go and find a constitution that uh, protects personal rights in a way that's better than our constitution. And I said, well, you know, answers in a postcard, but I haven't received many <laughs> postcards. Okay, well, I think that maybe is the perfect spot to, to, to bring this to a close. This has been an absolutely fantastic discussion which I have found really informative and have really enjoyed. And I know our listeners will really enjoy it again. And, you know, we, we ostensibly this was to talk about the McGee case, which, as we know, you are a number one champion of, and we as a society have benefited greatly from. But we also talked about other matters, and it was great to get your perspective on Rowan Wade and international developments. Um, yes, I know you're expecting this question. Uh, so I'm not sure I am, <laughs> actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can cut this bit. But um, uh, do, do you have a, a, a yet another book or uh, or film or other Piece work of, of art that you would like to recommend to uh, to our listeners? Um, all right. Um, I think I spoke about, um, you know, how I'm sort of, um, you know, listen to Bach every day and, uh, you know, no day would go without listening to Bach. And um, But I'm going to mention two other non-Bach pieces or non-Sibelius pieces uh, that 
are sometimes overlooked, uh, but I think they're really fantastic. One is Ravel's Le Tombeau de Coupon, um, which is written in memory of those who, some of his friends who died in the First World War, which I think is going to be played in the National Concert Hall in the next two, three weeks. And uh, it's a wonderful piece. And uh, Ottorino Rospighi's uh, La Pina di Roma, The Pines of Rome, with its wonderful uh, finish of the vision of uh, the Roman legion marching down the Appian Way uh, before they finish in a blaze of glory right outside the Senate building. I can hear the trumpets already. Supreme Court Justice Gerard Hogan, thank you very much for coming in and being a guest on our show. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. The Fifth Court will adjourn until next week. So that's all from this edition of The Fifth Court. We hope you have enjoyed it. Can we say a huge thank you to our guest, Mr. Justice Gerard Hogan, for coming in and talking to us about the McGee case and then going across the Atlantic with you, Mark, and talking about Roe versus Wade and then coming back and talking about the Norris decision. Was that a fascinating insight into constitutional law, Irish style? It certainly was, yeah. Yeah, no, it was really, really wonderful. And we know that that conference is taking place in Trinity on the McGee case. So we recommend anybody who wants to go along to that it would be really worth listening to. So, Mark, as I said at the start, this was our 50th episode. So, you know, do you want to say cheerio differently for our 50th episode or should we say the same thing well, as mean, we, we always we, do? We, we, we have the champagne bottles lined up here. I think here I'm filling up the, here, you know. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, getting it's very emotional. Anyway, from me, Peter Leonard. And myself, Mark Tottenham. Until the next time, thank you for listening and we'll see you soon in the Fifth Court. Mm-hmm.